Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Ryan, and I have the privilege to be the associate pastor here. And welcome to at least my first Facebook Live. Uh, Pastor Chris has been doing these the past uh, couple of days, so it's the first time I'm doing it live. It's the first time live with uh, the equipment I'm using today, and so we're just going to pray this all works out. We do apologize. We, we did want to start about 10 minutes ago, uh, but uh, we, this is now the 1124 uh, lunch, Lent lunch study. Uh, we have been having studies during Lent, and we have a great lunch, and we sit around in our gathering room, and we've been... And now we're just not able to do that due to health restrictions around the COVID-19 virus. Uh, but one thing that I, keep coming, that I keep coming back to is this idea that there are a lot of things that could be going on, a lot of options that we have in this time, but one option we don't have, and that is to stop being the church. And so we're learning new and different ways to connect with you and to do those things that make Centenary Centenary. And some of you may be watching, and you're not a regular part of our congregation, and we're excited uh, that you are here with us to see just a bit of what we do day to day. So we're going to, conti we're going to continue in the midst of this Lenten series. We welcome you. Uh, if you are watching live right now, uh, you're, part of, uh, you're part of something that can be interactive. Uh, Kathy Harper, our office manager, is here. And uh, she is, if you leave a question, in the, you can use the comments to leave a question if you're watching live. If you're watching this at 3 or 4 in the afternoon, time being what it is, I, I'm not going to be able to answer your question in real time. Uh, but I, try to get, I will watch the comments, try to get back to you, even if you're watching it later. But if you're watching it live, you send a comment or question, Kathy will read it to me and we'll discuss, uh, we'll discuss here. Um, so we are, we are glad that you are here. Uh, we're going to begin today. I invite you, if you have your Bibles with you, if you have one handy, you might take a moment to get one, or you have the app on your phone, uh, turn to the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, it's near the middle of your Bible, a little past the center in my Bible, uh, chapter 50, and we'll begin uh, at, the, at the fourth verse today. Uh, during this Lenten series, Pastor Chris and I are looking at the, in these lunch series at what are called the servant songs of Isaiah. Uh, they are... Uh, they are parts of this great prophetic book that Christians have, the, the Christian tradition, and I don't just mean tradition as in uh, things that we've believed for a thousand years, or even 1,500, but many of these in the New Testament itself uh, are uh, part uh, that these servant songs point us to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Now, one thing that has come up before is this question about whether Isaiah or the prophet who wrote this book was aware that they were talking about Jesus. And the answer is we don't know. It's probably unlikely, but we remember that God breathes these words into life, and so we believe that God had an eternal purpose for them that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at Isaiah 50, 4, through nine today, just six verses, uh, this third, this uh, servant song about the servant of the Lord. And so will you hear this word of God? We'll read today. I'm reading today from the New Revised Standard Version. Isaiah writes, The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helped me, who will declare me guilty. All of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Let's pray. And now, O oh, gracious Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this opportunity to come and to be in the presence of your living word, Jesus Christ, and that you would speak to us now by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your word is proclaimed to us today, that we may hear with joy what you have to say. And Lord, we need you to come and teach us by the Holy Spirit. Because if the Holy Spirit speaks, Lord, nothing else matters. But if the Holy Spirit does not speak, Lord, nothing else matters. And so speak to us, Lord, we pray, for we, your children, are listening. And Lord, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts 
be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength, and through Christ you are our mighty Redeemer. Amen. When we look at this passage or any passage from the Bible, this is going to be plainly obvious what I'm going to tell you. The most important thing we can think about is what is God trying to say? What is God trying to say? This is an interesting and unique passage, these six verses. Uh, they give us the picture of a servant. Now the question is, who is the servant? Now, in the Christian tradition, we say that the servant is Jesus of Nazareth, the one who is the Messiah, the Christ. Um, but but what, who did Isaiah think the servant was? In many of the servant songs that we've looked at in previous weeks and that we will look at in coming weeks during this 12-15 time, the servant is the people of Israel. And that may be true here. This may refer to the people of Israel as, as God's servant uh, that uh, is, to, is, to, is to give themselves for the life of the world. That is the purpose of the people of Israel. But it does appear in this one that we might be talking about an individual here. In addition... Uh, it says uh, earlier today that uh, that uh, I did not I was not rebellious, and uh, we know that from the beginning of chapter fifty points out that I, Israel as a people were rebellious. So we we're not sure that it was Israel. It may have been an individual. Uh, one commentator I I, I sourced uh, said it may have been uh, Zerubbabel, the governor of uh, the governor who helped rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. After the exile, when the, Babylon, when the Persians took over from the Babylonians and let the people go back uh, in, in the uh, er, late fifth century, uh, the late sixth century BC, um, so that is that's a possibility there. It, it could be any other. It could be the prophet himself uh, speaking to this. Uh, but what we see here is an image of the servant, the image of anyone who would serve God, and so. I want to look at this through the lens of the prophet of the Old Testament, but also looking at Jesus, and then also looking at how this can be a framework, although not identical, uh, to the kind of disciple and follower of Jesus that you and I are called uh, to be. So when we look at this first, it talks about that the Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. So the, the servant is one who teaches, but the teaching is almost secondary to what it says in the second half of verse 4 and verse 5. Morning by morning he wakens. We're talking about the Lord God here. Wakens my ears to listen as those who are taught. And so it's what, what I think that Isaiah is pointing out here is the one who teaches has first been taught. The one who learns teaches others. Uh, we look at the example of Jesus, and it's so interesting. It's one of the weirder, more unusual things we think about Jesus, but it's always so much fun, especially to talk to children and teenagers about, is this idea that Jesus grew. You know, most of us who are comfortable with the idea that Jesus is God in the flesh, God incarnate, we're comfortable with the idea that he was God, but then we're like, wait, but he wasn't yet fully in the stature that he was in the time of his ministry. After all, the writers of the gospel say that Jesus grew in stature and in wisdom, in favor with God and with human beings. So, so Jesus grew. We see that Jesus was, was teaching, but also learning in the temple when he went there when he was 12 years old. Uh, that he was one who was both taught and learned. And how was he taught? He was taught not only by religious leaders, but by his father. When, when you read the stories of Jesus, are you not struck by the number of times that Jesus says that he had to go to be with his father? So over and over, Jesus is learning, and Jesus is being formed by his Father, the Lord God. And why was Jesus doing that? Was he doing that because he didn't know enough? No, the, the answer was that as he became intimately connected with God, he was then able to connect with others. 
Does that make sense? That's kind of a strange thought, right? So, so as he was learning, he was also teaching. And so if Jesus has to learn in order to teach, I dare say neither you nor I are exempted from that. You and I have to learn to teach. Learning is at the center of, of being a disciple. The word disciple is, simil is the same word as student. To be a disciple of Jesus is to be a student of Jesus. That's why when Jesus gives the Great Commission in Matthew 28, you remember what it says. It says, go, make disciples. We know that part, right? Go and go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And so to be a disciple is to be one who is taught, but not just one who is taught, but one who teaches others. We see that with Jesus, when you look especially in Matthew and Luke, the uh, continued way that Jesus teaches. Uh, when he goes to his hometown of Nazareth, he teaches in the synagogue. Along the street, they call him rabbi, which means teacher. Jesus is one who teaches when we are a disciple, discipleship is not something that we only participate in in receiving. It's something we participate in in giving away. Uh, the secret to discipleship in God's church, in Jesus' church, is not one pastor teaching everyone and then growing arithmetically one by one. That is important. That is good. But the method that grew the church was one discipling someone out, discipling two, who then each disciple two, who then disciple two, and it grows geometrically. To use kind of a slightly uh, tasteless example, we can understand this best when we watch the coverage of the COVID-19. It is the same concept mathematically, not quite the same as you can imagine uh, in, in terms, but it's, you know, when they say one person affecting another. That's what discipleship is, but this is in a good way and not in a, not in a hazardous way, uh, of course. So that's kind of a silly example, but I suspect one that is at the front of your mind uh, right now. Uh, so we so he goes and that is how it is spread through the through the sharing and the preparation but then also the teacher uh, that is designed to sustain the weary that's what jesus does he says come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and i will give you rest jesus best work was not done with the strong and powerful it was done with the weak Yesterday I was reading the story about the woman who pressed in on him to grab the hem of his garment. There's that wonderful song, many of you may remember about that, uh, that, that, you, that comes to your mind at this point. Um, but he, he goes and he grabs the hem, that she grabs the hem of his, gar his garment after she has been desperate for anyone else to help, him, to help her. She had spent all her money, but it was Jesus who was able to heal her. And, and he says, your faith has made you well and so the servant the servant Jesus the prophet us today we have to be prepared we learn and we are formed in order to teach to serve to sustain the weary the second thing we hear about this is the servant is unrebellious the servant is unrebellious uh, prophets in the Old Testament uh, you find that what they have in common, at least the biblical prophets, is that people don't like them. You know, it turns out people like people who tell them that everything is going to be okay. And there were prophets in the Old Testament, and even in Jesus' day, that said, everything's fine, don't worry, no problems, we're all good. Those people often had good jobs and were very well paid. They were official prophets, and that's what they typically said. But so many of the prophets, the biblical prophets, and, and again, some of the biblical prophets were court prophets and were reasonably well treated. I don't want to create a false dichotomy, a false division between, the, between biblical prophets and court prophets. It isn't, simply is not there. Um, but what we see is so many of the biblical prophets, the end of, for them is, um, is uh, to, to, be, uh, to, to be mistreated. To be mistreated. And 
And, and that's what uh, the servant says. The servant says, I have given my back to those who struck me and to my cheeks, to those who pulled out the beard. I, I've been wearing a beard for like, I don't know, six years, six and a half years. Um, and so it's a new thing to me. The beard I read in the ancient world was a sign of one's freedom and respect. Now, I have to admit, they tell me I might have to shave my beard if I have to start wearing one of these masks. And I can do that. I don't know what I'll look like, but I can do it. But I do not want to pull out my beard. Think of how those of you men who have facial hair, or really just kind of any hair, really, anyone has, uh, think of that and pull out each one of them, the pain that would cause. That's what he's saying. He says, to those who would torment me, I, I gave myself to them. Does that not look like an image of, of Jesus? You see, Jesus is there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is sweating blood, Scripture teaches us. He knows that his hour that John talks about in his gospel has come. He knows that it's here. He knows that he's about to be betrayed uh, unto sinful men. He is going, and then likely to be beaten and tortured and executed. He knows that. And Jesus says, you know, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But he says, yet not my will, but your will be done. See, that's the servant. That's what makes Jesus so interesting. We are people who seek comfort. We are people who seek shelter. We are people who, who seek that, that nothing bad would happen to us. But Jesus is one that, it, that he followed God's will, even if it meant that he was in trouble. He, he does. He gives himself up uh, to, to those who, uh, who would attack him. And so Jesus did not necessarily have his beard torn out, but he was beaten with, uh, in an unbelievable way. He was put to shame by being hanged on a cross. You know, Jesus, uh, uh, you know, Jesus, when Jesus was arrested, it was uh, Peter who pulled a sword and he, and he was ready to begin the rebellion, the big rebellion against Rome. And he started by, and, and by, the, and by the, the corrupt religious officials, and he started right by, what do we know, by cutting off the ear of the high priest's slave, when, uh, the high priest's slave. And so he does that. And at that moment, if, if it, it, Jesus, Jesus could have it said, called legions of angels to come to defeat the Romans, to defeat the religious officials, to proclaim him the political king. Uh, Jesus had the power to be marched straight into downtown Rome and to be installed as Caesar of the Roman Empire. And that's what you and I would have done. But Jesus saw the bigger picture. Jesus saw something more than that. And and, and he saw that in that, his primary duty was not to amass power, not to amass comfort, uh, not but to be obedient to God. And uh, that's what we do as disciples. Uh, we are in a time, can I say this? We are in a time where our comfort is being tried. We're going to mass up as much stuff as we can haul out of Kroger so we can keep ourselves as long as we can. Oh, listen, I've done that. Don't worry. Although I will say they now have a three can limit there. I thought, oh, three per can. No, it's three cans total. So they do have cans on the shelf, but good luck getting too many of them. Uh, some of you have amassed a ton of food already. Uh, but even then, when you're on your 33rd can of uh, canned green peas, uh, it will not. <laughs> Kathy is not appealed to by this. Uh, it will not. It will not be comfortable. And, and that is so minor compared to what Jesus went through. The, the question is, we're being challenged in our comfort. And, and I love comfort. I love good food. I love comfortable things. I love that. And we love that as people. I dare say even as a church family, we love that. And comfort is not evil. It is not bad. There's no evidence that Jesus was never comfortable. But when it comes down to it, following God's will will not always lead us to comfort. Well, I'm preaching now, so that's okay. Uh, I'm preaching. So we'll get back to this. It says here uh, 
that uh, in, when, when one uh, offers himself to public ridicule, some other thought, it was to admit that they had done something wrong. See, they lived in a world where they believed the definition of justice, and this is not totally precise, but it's, it, I think it's close enough, is that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And you and I kind of live by that. We think that's pretty ideal, right? That good things would happen to good people, bad things would happen to bad people. And, and that's what they live by. So when, they, so when people walked by and they saw Jesus being crucified, what does the Bible tell us? It says those who walked by mocked him. Now, some of them mocked him as a failed revolutionary, but some of them who may not have known who Jesus was mocked him as they went by because they said, well, if he's on a cross... He must be a bad person. And so, but what we find here is the servant says, I am offering myself even to be hated, even if I've done nothing wrong. Why is that? How could that be? Well, the last couple of verses tell us. He says, I know I shall not be put to shame because he who vindicates me is near. In verse 8 and 9, the, 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 the vision, the image we see is an image of a courtroom. It says a vindicator, one who justifies me, one who makes me right. It, it, one commentator says in verses 8 and 9, we have the image of, of a defense attorney, that he's got the best attorney. He's got like the Johnny Cochran of the ancient world or something. He, he's got someone who will come and says uh, that when this person comes with me, uh, who will dare contend with me? Who will dare to press charges? Who will dare confront me? And for the servant, the vindicator, the defense attorney, is God. Verse 9 says, it is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. If, if, if God is for us, then who will be against us. With this defense attorney, what prosecutor would dare to make a case? And so we see here that, uh, that, that part, of the, part of being the servant is even in troubled times to trust that God is the one who will set us free. Earlier in Isaiah it says, surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. And that's where we see what Jesus was. All this, again, pointing to Jesus, right? We see that there on the cross, we see that verse. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting the first verse of Psalm 22. And in that first verse of Psalm 22, uh, he comes and, um, and he is quoting. And some say, well, that's a sign he is so separate from God. And that may be true. But if you read later, it may have been that Jesus was quoting a psalm with a phrase. It's believed then as now that if you give a phrase of something, you may be trying to call people's attention to the entire work. For example, if I were to quote, the Lord is my shepherd, what am I talking about? You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the 23rd Psalm or uh, when I speak of God's amazing grace, how many of you can hear that song the great words of John Newton in your ear, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Well, Psalm 22 is a, is, a, is a dark psalm, but it is one that ends by saying that God will deliver. You see, I believe on the cross, Jesus knew that he was being vindicated by God because he had learned from God. He knew his mission. He was obedient to God. And the Lord vindicates him. And how does the Lord vindicate Jesus? Not by rescuing him from the cross. Not by sending angels to take him down. But by three days later rising, raising him from the dead. The vindication of his mission. That his, uh, that, that he, his mission to go and to rescue us to, from the very clutches of sin and death. had been, And that he had done final and mortal battle with sin and death. And three days later, we find that Jesus is raised from the dead and he's alive. And so who's won? Jesus or death? We see that God has vindicated. And it's and later in, in Acts chapter 2, 
Peter says to the people, this, Je this Jesus whom you killed, God raised him from the dead. God vindicated him. And so being a servant of God means one that we stay close to him, that we learn from him. You know, I, I think about learning. One thing I forget, failed to mention earlier is learning is not just facts. It's about learning by being in relationship. Does that make sense to anyone else? Now, how did the disciples learn? It wasn't like, you know, Jesus, I'm going to have a, Jesus is going to have a master class every week. And we're going to go through, uh, we're going to go through point by point who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is. That is good. That is right. But the primary way that the disciples learned from Jesus was by being with him every day. And that's how we learn. And that's how our trust is built. And so I mentioned, I say to you, we're in difficult times. And my constant word has been that of the scriptures, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. Do not be afraid, for I have called you by name. Our only hope in the midst of this is Jesus, is God to come and save us and to vindicate us even in the midst of our torment. Now that may not, that doesn't necessarily mean, I was thinking, I was trying to write something and I just couldn't get the words to it. It does not mean that we will, I've heard some people and, and I love them and, and, they are, and, I, and I, I pray they are right, uh, that say, well, if you're a Christian, you will not be affected by this. this is, that may be true, but I doubt it. We are not promised. There's so much, so much in cultural Christianity that says that if you trust God, nothing bad will happen to you. This is something that is read by people who, have, who is said by people who have never read the Bible. Because when you read the Bible, things happen to people, even good people, even people who trust in God. I do believe God will protect us eternally. But I want to say that God, we, we cry out to God to save us. And, uh, and we, pray that, we pray that we are not impacted. I pray every day that no one I know, that no one I love, that no one in our church family, no one in my family, no one of my friends are affected by this virus. And we pray that we know that only God can turn this back. And so we, we look and we say, hey, we trust God is our deliverer. God is the one who can rescue us. And not just in this moment, but in all the moments of our life, that in the end, when we are attacked, when we are persecuted, that we trust that our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so that's just a look at these six short verses. And so I, I invite you to continue this conversation. Um, and, and if you have any further questions, I'd love to talk to you by comments, uh, by email. Uh, you can email me at sean, S-E-A-N, at danvillecumc.org. And uh, we are excited uh, to continue to offer content. Uh, there will be a Bible study, I believe, this evening. Pastor Chris will lead uh, that, uh, will be, uh, that, will be, that we will be a, a part, that, we'll have, that we will offer, and we'll continue to look at the last days of Jesus' life. So I think I said we're, we're closing out in 30 minutes. Do we have anything else? Uh, and, and so uh, I'm going to invite you now uh, to, to think through these things. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. And uh, we're going to close in a time of prayer. I keep you in my prayers every day. Uh, we pray for those. I invite you to pray for those in our congregation, particularly those who are older or have health concerns right now. Uh, and pray that uh, we, we stay strong in our faith and that uh, we follow those three simple things that we see in Isaiah 50, that we are people who learn to teach that we are people who, who uh, follow and don't rebel and trust God and then hope and trust in God to vindicate us uh, and, and deliver us. So uh, we're going to pray together in a moment. I'm going to open us by a prayer that I, I suggested on my personal Facebook page for us to pray uh, together during this season. It is one of the classic prayers uh, from Lent, this, uh, this uh, liturgical time of the year as we prepare for Easter uh, but it's also one that I think is very timely for our time. So we'll close in that, and then uh, we'll, we'll pray together. So let's pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever.
And our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that in your word you speak to us. And we, pray, we thank you that the word of your servant, that is the word of Jesus, can also be the word for all of us who claim to be followers and disciples of Jesus. And so let that move and, and stir in our hearts this day and always, we pray. Uh, Father, we pray for those who are affected by this virus. We pray for those who have already been diagnosed, those who are fearful that they have it, those awaiting tests. And we pray especially for those who are older, those who are in need. We pray for those who are lonely right now, for those who are struggling right now. Uh, Father, that you would be their comfort and their companion in these times. Uh, Father, that you would lead us. And we pray for your supernatural mercy to deliver us. We are, we are open to your will and your way. Uh, we do not believe that uh, to follow you means something bad ever happens, but we pray and we seek you uh, for this world, for relief from this pandemic. And so, Father, watch over us, bless us, keep us, make your face shine upon us, and be gracious unto us, lift up your countenance upon us, and grant us peace. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for being part of this. Have a blessed day.